That was a little bit scary. That was scary. Okay. Are we getting signed yet? I don't know. <laughs> Epaphroditus. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just keep an eye on that. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so Epaphroditus is a disciple of, he's in the church in Philippi. And he travels to where Paul is in prison. Again, probably Ephesus. And Epaphroditus has gone from Philippi to Paul in prison, bringing a gift for Paul. Because Paul is in prison, he needs to be supported through food and clothing. And um, so Epaphroditus has brought this gift to Paul and while he's in prison and now is returning to Philippi. And so Epaphroditus has brought this gift, he's given it to Paul, and Paul then writes this letter basically as a kind of thank you note back to the church in Philippi. So that's the context before we even get to the text itself. So questions, but I'm going to pause there because I know that's a that's a bit of information. Let me pause there. Questions about anything that I've just described in terms of the context that's happening in this particular text. I just have a, did Paul yes. actually write these or did somebody write them for him? Oh, this is such a great question. So Paul in prison, so this is a complicated question because Paul, the prison letters are probably written in a different kind of context than when he's not in prison. So there's a practice in antiquity that's called writing with what's called an amanuensis, which is just a fancy word for saying that um, a person uses a secretary in order to write a letter. But whether he, Paul would be able to use that amanuensis while he's in prison is a, is a question. So is Paul orally, is he verbally communicating to a disciple who then is having someone outside of the prison write it down with a secretary? Um, we don't know. Or is it Paul himself who's writing well in prison? How would he get access to writing materials while in prison? Um, these are all the complicated questions that scholars love to debate about, <laughs> um, but there isn't necessarily a ton of information about. So one theory is that Paul will communicate what he wants to say to a disciple while he's in the prison, and then that person who he communicates it to takes it outside the prison and then has it written down. That's one theory about what might have happened with Philippians in particular. Um, but there's just not a, um, there's unfortunately just not a lot of information about how that writing process would happen. Yeah, I wasn't, I didn't see how he would be able to, that they would be kind enough to give him writing right, materials exactly. and why he's in prison. I mean, uh -huh. Maybe they were really nice, I don't know. But Probably I just, not. Yeah. I, just, <laughs> I just didn't see quite how he would be able to do that. Yeah, how he would be able to do that. Yeah, so it's probably, it's probably a verbal correspondence that then gets written down outside of the prison itself. Yeah, that's a great question. I have a question. Yeah. I don't think this great is that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's a great question, Dottie. <laughs> um, is this uh, congregation or group of people well established and they've been functioning as a Christian community for a while? In does, Philippi? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, at least, a, probably at least a decade. Does or Paul? Two mostly write letters because something's going wrong or just to get to them and say, hey, you're doing a great job. This is all, this is a great question too, Dottie, totally. She's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. So what's really important to keep in mind about these letters is that they are what I would call pastoral correspondence in the sense that Paul has a pastoral relationship with each of these churches. And so Philippians is particular in that it's it's sometimes called the joyful letter oh because mm -hmm. philippians is really about the affection that paul has with the church at philippi there's this dense communication that's been happening with them there's all of these messages and all of this um visiting that's going back and forth between paul in prison and the church in philippi and so there's this theme that runs throughout Philippians about joy. Mm -hmm. um, Paul really loves on the Philippians in this particular letter, which is very different than, say, Galatians, which is known as the angry letter. 
So in Galatians, mm. like Paul is pissed. <laughs> no, seriously. And like he is well, writing. He's not too happy with the Corinthians no. either. No, he's also not happy with the Corinthians <laughs> either. So it, it so it's a yes and no in the sense that sometimes Paul is like the tone of the letter sometimes can be very affectionate, but then sometimes the tone of the letter can be very angry. Um, like yeah so it really depends on the particular mm -hmm. relationship with that church but it also depends on the particular context and so one of the ways that these letters get described is that they're what's called occasional letters so they're written for a particular purpose it to a particular context for a specific reason and so paul is not writing a theological treatise right he's trying to solve particular pastoral problems with particular communities that are facing particular circumstances. And so they're very specific and very contextual. And again, we're just eavesdropping, right? We're just listening in to the, to the correspondence that's happening while Paul is trying to sort out all these different issues that are happening in our own church. Yes. We think of uh, correspondence as being positive, but there has to have been some things that people did not anticipate and were, were not happy about receiving. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like with Corinthians and Galatians. Yeah. Oh, That's definitely. What we're just talking about that mm -hmm. not all of Paul's letters are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think yeah. Philippians is more of an exception yeah. Than, yeah. than the rule because yeah. Philippians, although it's characterized as the joyful letter, mm -hmm. is mostly not the Pauline correspondence. Mm -hmm. um, most of it's a little bit more trying to problem solve. Um, and some of it has can be sort of angry to defensive to there's lots of emotions that are going on in these letters. Because when we first started this conversation, mm -hmm. you asked us to to talk about ways in which we communicate. Exactly. Yep. And, and there are many ways in which we are not happy about communicating. Yes, definitely, definitely. And so I think that's exactly what's going on in these letters too, is that just like in communication, we get the whole range of human emotion Sometimes people are happy to be in touch with each other. Sometimes people are not so happy when they're in touch with each other. We have the same thing in the text in that sometimes Paul is really excited to talk to a particular church. Sometimes he's really not. Um, and so that's, that's really kind of the humanness of these texts. And just like we are in our humanity, have, we have very different experiences <clears throat> in the correspondence. Sometimes it's really positive, sometimes it's really negative, sometimes it's everything in between. We really get the same thing here in the text as well. But you would hope that he would be mostly encouraging. You would hope, but <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately that's not the picture that we get in most of the letters. Which is, yeah, I think kind of, again, speaks to the humanity of Paul, perhaps more than, more than anything. Yes, you had a question. Um, well, I'm thinking this isn't the first communication either, and this no. seems to be an established congregation. Mm -hmm. And also, they've been supportive of Paul, yes. and they're sending money or whatever, you know, to take care of him. So, yeah, no wonder he's thankful. Yeah. <laughs> Happy and, and positive about mm -hmm. encouraging them to continue to support each other, whatever needs to be done to keep the church going in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's involved here too. Oh, definitely. You know, I've often wondered if this congregation were to be transmitted or you know, just sent back in time, that we were one of the first early congregations. And what, I mean, the things that we deal with today to me would be minuscule to being concerned if you're going to get killed because mm -hmm. you have to. I don't know. Do you live in Philly? <laughs> oh, yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. But I don't know if they're being killed for their belief in God. No. That's what I'm saying. So, so in other words, you gather and you have this profound faith, hopefully, and yet things in the, in the worldly part of your life may not be so hunky dory, you mm -hmm. know? So, I'm not trying to defend the Galatians or the Corinthians, but I just wonder for myself, 
who I would be if I was in that situation, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. back at that moment. Yeah. Any other questions about the context before we start looking at the text itself? Okay. So now that so we've been talking about correspondence in general or the ways that people are in touch with one another. And we've talked a little bit about the context now of the letter to the Philippians in particular. So because I'm going to focus on letters for the next three weeks together, or well, this week and then the following two weeks, I want to do a little bit of work on what are the particular forms in the letter or what are the particular um, structures? Because I think this will be helpful for understanding how these letters get put together. So let's think about letter writing in particular, but you can also think about this in the context of email or even in the context of text messages, but think about letter writing, but emails and text as well. So when you start a letter or an email, how do you usually start it? Reading. With a greeting. A greeting. And what and what does that greeting sound like? Friendly, positive. And, and what are the words that you use? Mm, well, dear so and so or dear, hello so and so yep, or dear or hello. Are there mm -hmm. a, or even greetings? Right. I sometimes I'll I'll use that in emails. Greetings. Mm -hmm. uh, name. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So dear <coughs> uh Dottie or dear pastor so and so or dear, you know my beloved grandchild, whatever. So in the, these letters in the New Testament, the, the fancy word for the dear is called the prescript. So this, this, is, the, this is one of the fancy words that you can take away from today. So the, the way that the prescript is always structured is you have the sender and then the recipient and then the greeting. So it's a little bit, so we typically start a letter, dear so-and-so. And so the structure is a little bit different in that we first we have a sender, and then we have a recipient, and then we have the word dear, what we would think of as the word dear. So let's let's look, actually look at the way that this shows up in Philippians. So if you um, so if you're uh, it looks like y'all people are so on top of it, you've already got your Bibles open to Philippians. I'm so impressed. Okay. So let's look at um, Philippians, just verses one and two. So who would like to read Philippians one and uh, just chapter one, verses one and two? Yeah, go for it. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, to the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Awesome. Thank you. So this is this is our what we call the prescript. So notice Paul and Timothy. So these are our these are our senders, and we get a little bit of description of Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. So we get the sender, and then we have the recipient. So to all the saints in Christ Jesus, and which particular saints? The ones who are in Philippi. So here we have the sender is Paul and Timothy to the recipients who are the saints who are in Philippi, so the, the Philippian church, with the bishops and deacons. And then we have the greeting in, in verse two. Grace to you and peace from God our Father or God our parent and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that, say that often here in church, you hear that. Exactly, so grace to you and peace, that language comes from the Pauline letters. And that language is Paul's way of saying hello or dear. <laughs> um, so that's the structure. We have the sender, who is Paul and Timothy, to the saints in Philippi, and then the greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father, God our parent, and the, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this, these first two verses function as what we might think of as the envelope of the letter. So you know how on an envelope you've got the um, you've got the return address and then you've got the address that it's being sent to. So that's really what a prescript is. It's 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 functioning really as the envelope of the letter. So here those first two verses are really just the envelope. And but we've already got some content in there. So now when you say dear Sally, right in your letter. 
So what are, after you say dear Sally, which is your greeting, what do you usually include next? So you say, how are you? How you are you? About the other yep. How are you well? If it's, a, if it's personal, if it's business, mm -hmm. you say I'm writing about okay, uh -huh. the content. Exactly. Yep. So how are you if it's personal or, you know, I am writing with regards to mm -hmm. if it's a business letter. Yep. Are there, are there any other things that you might say after the dear Sally? I hope this letter finds you well. I hope this letter mm -hmm. finds you well. Yep. I, I have a version of that myself in my emails where I'll say something like, I trust this email finds you safe as well. Mm -hmm. yep. um, other, other things that you might say after the dear Sally. I've missed you. I've missed you. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about you. I was thinking about you. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Sorry it's been so long since I've written to you. <laughs> Sorry it's been so long since I've written to you. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Other ways that you might start a letter after the dear Sally or an maybe, email. Maybe referring to something from a letter that you got from them. Yeah. Ah, uh-huh. Yes. In reply to your letter. In yeah. reply to your yeah. letter that I received on thus and such date. Or it was yeah. so good to hear from you. Yeah. Or it was so good to, yeah, a little more, a little more informal. It was so good to hear from you. Thanks so much for, yeah. Anything else that you might say after the dear Sally? Well, then how you're doing. Yeah. And after once you inquired about the other person. Yeah. Yeah, good. So in the letters, in antiquity, which what's typically happens next after after the dear Sally, the equivalent of how are you doing or, you know, I trust that you're well or however we might say that next thing in the letter is what's called the Thanksgiving. So this is what typically happens next is the Thanksgiving is the I give thanks for you. Um, and this is the whole next section of the letter. And so this is actually the reading that was appointed for today is specifically the Thanksgiving of the letter. So we'll read, we'll read this, um, we'll come back to the Thanksgiving in a little bit, but I just wanna point out for you that the text that was appointed for today is specifically the Thanksgiving. Yes. And you're writing on behalf of a group and you're writing to a group. Uh-huh. So it's not just you. Right. So are you talking about Philippians or are you talking about just sort of in general? Well, oh. Yeah. So sometimes it can be personal correspondence of a person to a person, or it could be a whole group of people to a whole group of people, or an individual or two people. In this case, we have Paul and Timothy who are writing then to a whole group of people, which is the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, this is a really good nuance as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the one other structure of the letter that I want to take a look at. So how do you typically end a letter? What do, what do you typically put at the end of the letter or the email? Sincerely or love. Sincerely yeah. or love. Yeah, other things you end the letter or the email. Yeah, regards. Uh-huh, regards. Hope to hear from you. <laughs> Hope to hear from you. Yeah, anything else? Another thank you sometimes. Yep, definitely. Sincerely, warmly. Hope to see you in person. Hope to see you in person. Yeah, definitely. Blessings. Blessings. Yeah. I have a colleague who ends all of his emails with "The Lord be with you." Uh, <laughs> it's also exactly. Exactly. It's such an interesting way to end. Uh, and good email for a sponsor. I like it. Um, so. In these letters in the New Testament, the, the sincerely or warmly or regards is called the postscript. So, the, so these are the three words that I want you to take away from. So we have the prescript, which is the dear. And then we have the next section is the thanksgiving, which we're gonna come back to in a second. And then there's the body of the letter, which we're not gonna look at today. But then the thing that ends the letter is called the postscript. So these are our three sets of things, the prescript, the thanksgiving, and then the postscript. So let's just take, just for the sake of example, let's take a look at the postscript in Philippians. So it is, um, it's going to start in chapter four at verse 21. So who would like to read just um, 21, 22, and 23? I yes, will. <clears throat> please, thank you. 
Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Great, thank you. So that would be the equivalent of the sincerely Paul. Um, is that there's actually typically in a postscript and it's some additional greetings that happen at the end of the letter. Who is this emperor he's talking about? Mm. Yeah, this is a this is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. So it's probably people who are representative of the Roman emperor who are in the colony or the city of Philippi. So these are probably Roman government officials. Christian? Maybe. I mean, it sounds to me like they'd be Christian. Yeah. yeah. And, and shouldn't they be in Philippi? Because he's so many degrees. Exactly. Right? Yep. So these are probably people who are representatives of the Roman government who are in Philippi who happen to also be part of the church in Philippi. Oh. Yeah. Big name. Or, or would they be would they actually be from Ephesus if he's in prison in Ephesus? Because he's sending all the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household, because he sent. Oh, that's a good point. Yes. So these yeah, these true. might be it. These might be people where Paul is in prison. Yep. Bless you. Good point. Bless you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's now let's now that we've done a little bit about the structure of the letter itself. Now let's actually take a look at the Thanksgiving. So now that you've got all this context. <laughs> We know a little bit about what's happening in this correspondence between the Philippians and Paul. We know a little bit now about the structure of how these letters are set up. Now let's now that we've got all of that, I think now we can hear the Thanksgiving itself a little bit differently. Okay, so let's let's hear it at least twice. Um, if someone would like to read chapter one verses three to eleven. Um, and let's hear it. Uh, we'll hear it once. We'll have a little bit of a pause. And then if someone else would like to read it, we'll hear it again. So who would like to read it at the first time? Carol, do you want to start as well? Sure. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. You want a second reason? Yes. Emily, would you? Very upbeat. Yes. Love that. Yeah. Very upbeat. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will be, bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart for all of you share in God's grace with me both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Thank you. That's beautiful. So yeah. what words or phrases strike you? Yes. 
pure and ba- blameless. I mean, I don't know anybody that's going to be pure and blameless. Amen to that. That is true. It's true. It's true. Other words or phrases that strike you. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it seems like they. You know, he's convinced that the day of Jesus Christ is coming. Yeah. Yes. Or yeah. Maybe be pure right. and blameless within a matter yeah. of three days. Or try. <laughs> yeah. And where in the text, uh, you're absolutely right. But and where in the text do you see that evidence that that he thinks that Jesus is about to come back? You started some good works, and I'm sure you're going to get it done. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, particularly, take a look at verse 6 here. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is probably one of the reasons why this gets included in Advent 2 in particular, because Mm -hmm. there's there's all of this language here of expectation, Mm -hmm. right? I expect that soon that you will, that um, this good work, uh, the one who began this good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. So there's, there's, all, there's all of this expectation that's happening in this correspondence. Yeah, other words or phrases that straight you know, I, I know how the sentence ends with what Vicki said, and I can certainly share that view, but I love it. To me, it's so comforting. And this is my prayer. Mm-hmm. That you have that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight. I love that. Mm-hmm. Or love somebody to pray for me for that. Yes, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and this is great evidence of the what of what really is a pastoral relationship between Paul and this church at Philippi, where he is praying. I mean, this is part of the the structure of what of the Thanksgiving. Um, that, you know, typically a Thanksgiving is going to be something like, I give thanks for you and I hope that you're in good health. That's, that's typically what a Thanksgiving would look like in antiquity. But Paul takes this sort of up a notch and says that he is thanking God every time that I remember you, constantly praying with joy. Yeah, so, and joy, that's sort of the first instance where we get that. But here, I mean, Paul really is praying yeah. um, in, for this, this church at Philippi. Yeah. Other words or phrases that strike you? The, the, uh, the, the same verse six, I wasn't focusing so much on the coming of the imminent coming of Christ, but just his confidence that God mm. will work within us. Mm-hmm. That, and it may not be immediate, it could be forever, you know, it could be a lifetime, but it's that he's confident that God is going to be working within each person to right. bring the fullness. And isn't it so much more powerful to know that he's saying that he's confident while yes. he's in prison? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, that it, I think that's what makes this all the more extraordinary is that he is under what's probably tremendous physical hardship. And he's being supported by these churches that he can't see, but has to trust that they're going to show up to prison with things to help care for him. And yet, even in the midst of all of that hardship, he says, I am confident. I am confident of this. You know, um, there were times in my life as a classroom teacher when I would say to one of my kiddos, I know right now you don't believe in yourself, but just so you know, I believe in you. I will mm-hmm. always believe in you. Yeah. And to me, that is terrible mm-hmm. for someone to say that to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, not just that you're doing a good job or whatever, but I believe in who you are. And, and I love the also the, the phrase that God is there always, even when you can't feel them. You know, not too long ago, I was at an event where the father was introducing me to his son and said, well, he's one of the lost souls now because he doesn't go to church. And I could just see in the the son who was grown up and married in his eyes and i just turned to him and i looked and i said gee i don't think you are lost mm-hmm. and i said no matter who you are where you go god is with you mm-hmm. and he just looked at me and he took my hand and he said thank you but i was so upset that the father said that mm-hmm. a father mm-hmm. to to a child and, and this man is not evil or whatever and obviously it was breaking his heart that his son 
It's right. not worshiping. And I get mm -hmm. all that. I get all that. Mm -hmm. There's not one person here probably doesn't have that in their families in some place or, or another. But you never want to say to somebody you love that you stop believing. And that's the beauty. God never stops believing in us. Mm -hmm. And that's like what Paul is saying here. Yeah, powerful, terrible stuff. Thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. Other, yes, please. Uh, just a short part of one. It's for all of you sharing God's grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I like that God's grace is put in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And notice how contextual it is. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. That like there's that God's grace is, is experienced for Paul in the particularities of his circumstances. That God's grace is something that is flowing through his imprisonment, through this correspondence, through this gift giving, through all of the trips that are happening back and forth between this church and the prison. So that, that God's grace is something that's not just this abstract theological idea, but God's grace is something that flows through the, the letter writing and the gift exchange and like all of the ministry that's happening in the midst of this particular community. Yeah, any other words or phrases? Why does he say the one who began a good work among you why doesn't he just say God? Uh, yeah, it's, that's interesting. So I wonder here, and you know, this is me thinking out loud here, that this might be a reference to who founded the church at Philippi. So that's what I thought. Um, that it, and of course, that's being empowered by God and by God's spirit. But I, I wonder if here he's talking about the the particular folks that were beginning that ministry and the ways in which he's understanding that ministry is coming to completion because he expects that Jesus is coming back tomorrow <laughs> um, in, in this particular context. So I, I think that's probably what's being referenced there. Oh, a person. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got God. Yeah, I think it's probably the, the, the people who founded the church mm -hmm. and the ways in which okay. those, those people are, are being, and, and God is certainly in the midst of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Isn't that profound? I mean, how beautiful. Just the small section of it. Beautiful. And I keep thinking of Paul pre, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pre conversion, <laughs> pre struck mm -hmm. line, you know, on the road to the maze. You know, who would have ever thought that that person could be talking like this and be thinking like this and acting like this and be willing to die for this? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is just so beautiful, which is more, mostly shows you. Yes, he's wonderful, but it, to me, it mostly shows me the power of God mm -hmm. working in any of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even Paul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. even Salty Paul. <laughs> yeah. yeah, any other words or phrases in the Thanksgiving that strike you? Yeah, I, I just think about how some we know of churches that have been begun by individuals who have such a strong belief that this is so important you know, that they need to start and it starts in somebody's home or and then gains momentum and gets bigger and bigger. So that's that's what I was thinking too, that it started the message is thanking the person who started the congregation. Yeah. Great. Any other final comments or questions before we close out for today? I love that reading. I just I just find it so great. Awesome. Hard to believe that all, all of these letters were actually people going to see him. I picture this jail as being nobody gets in. Mm -hmm. You're there to be punished. You don't get somebody to visit you. Mm -hmm. And and we're saying that people actually came often. Yes. Yeah. There's at least seven different trips that are assumed just in this letter. Ruth, historically, uh, with being in prison. Now, I'm not referencing necessarily biblical times, but a little bit later on in history, uh, much of the quality of your care was determined by people outside, mm -hmm. bringing up either paying for your, your care or bringing food or whatever. There was, were not taxes as such that were going into that. So people were coming in and out, even though you might ultimately be drawn and quartered, <laughs> you know, but for a period of time. So I think that was pretty common. Mm 
-hmm. Yeah, not just with the likes of Paul, but mm -hmm. someone else that might have been in prison. And didn't Paul actually, actually this is a roundabout way of saying it, actually not have a be in prison totally that he that he spent part, part of being in prison was not totally there that he could come and go. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean I there isn't a lot in the letter itself that points to the specifics of that. I mean, I think we can assume that if he's in prison, that he probably isn't at will to go far. Um, even if he was allowed to be outside the prison, um, that he's he's probably stuck there in this particular circumstance. Um, whether he was allowed out, but then he would have to come back. Um, but none of the specifics, unfortunately, are, are talked about in the letter. All right. Well, uh, I think thank um, you. Thank you so much. Before we leave, I want to wish Vicki a safe journey. Her she has to go down and take care of grandbabies. Oh, good. My because daughter called last night and uh the second grader, someone has COVID, so she has oh. to quarantine all week. So I'm gonna go oh, entertain a second thing. grader. Oh, oh boy. Oh wow. <laughs> you'll, you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I'll enjoy it, but Grace it's not work. to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good and gracious God, you are a God who comes to us through scripture, and you are a God who comes to us through the opening of that scripture and the laughter and conversation and discussion that happens in the midst. We give you thanks for this time, and we give you thanks for the Ministry of Upper Dublin and for its adult education forum. We pray, especially as we go on our way for the care and comfort of those that we encounter. We pray that you would be with us as we travel and as we encounter family and friends in this season. And we pray that you would be in our hearts as we wait and watch and expect for your coming in Christmas. We pray all of this in the holy and precious name of your child, Jesus. Amen. 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 Christ's prayer. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. What a Thank gift you were bringing us. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank what a gift. And um, I applaud you. Dottie, can you folks hang on? Yeah, I do want to leave it here.